Greetings. Um, if you were with us the last time, you heard us discussing this event known as the French Indian War, which pitted the British against the French for a battle of supremacy in the North American continent. You should know by now that the British are going to emerge from this conflict victorious, but in the process, they're going to come out of it with a lot of debt. That, that's one of the biggest legacies of um, the war is, is that the British are going to take out a lot of debt. Another legacy is, is really going to involve well, who's going to pay for it. Um, the bottom line is, by the end of the war in 1763, the British had raised taxes on pretty much everybody within their empire, with the exception of the American colonists. And in, in one respect, there's very few places left to turn other than America. But taxes and taxation are not the only things that are, are, are being discussed and debated at the end of the French Indian War. We also made the case that one of the legacies is that the British laid troops in North America, which was uh, a point of contention. There was this old English law that... Um, it wasn't really written down, but it certainly was understood that if the king is not at war, you should not be seeing his troops. And here they are in every street corner. And so the bottom line is, yes, the British are victorious, but there's all these question marks moving forward. And that's really where I want to start our conversation. OK. Now, a big part of why the British were so, so starved for cash was not just that they, they were not taxing the American colonies very directly. They weren't even collecting the taxes that, that were already on the books. By the end of the war in 1763, over 69% of Britain's budget has already been earmarked for the military. That is a staggering figure. And one individual that really brings this out in the open is the guy that you're looking at on the screen there. That's a guy by the name of Lord Boot. Um, Boot was a member of the House of Lords, and that's our version our version of the Senate would equate to the British House of Lords. In any case, he not only brings up this budget issue, um, he says, listen, we've got a lot of these taxes that are already on the books. We just need to actually go out there and enforce them. Um, we have import and export duties on things coming into the American colonies, things that are being shipped out. But the problem is we're not really collecting those taxes. Instead, what the British had been exercising for a long, long time is a process that has come to be known as salutary neglect. Now, this is important. Um, every time that there was a black market deal going down in New York's Harbor, for example, uh, illegal black market tea, for example, um, the British military officers always were looking over there. They, they always had their back turned at just the right time. This is what we mean by salutary neglect. These British customs officers, they knew that the law was being, being, being broken, but they were either ignoring it or they were purposefully not paying attention. And the reason is we were good for business. We bought a lot of British material. Uh, we sent them a lot of valuable raw material. We were good for business, and before the French-Indian War, the, the British economy was strong enough, robust enough, to be able to get away with this. It's not anymore. I mean, it's a whole new game after the war because they've taken on so much debt. And the point that Boot is trying to make is we, we could already generate a lot more revenue if we just started collecting taxes and ended this process or this practice of salutary neglect. Of course, what the colonists argued is, is if you're going to raise our taxes, then you ought to give us representation in, in Parliament. More of that in just a minute. Right now, I'd like you to understand that the end of the war brings in a new prime minister, a new political leader to the British Parliament. And that guy's a guy by the name of George Grenville. He is well known as a reformer, and he's also seen as a very capable person. One of the first things that he does is indicates to the American colonists, get ready to see your taxes go up. Um, we need new sources of revenue and we've looked high and low and you're really the only group of British citizens in our empire that hasn't seen this. And so get ready to see an increase in your taxes. 
Another thing that he does in 1764 is he issues something called the Currency Act. Now, a couple things about this. The, the currency that was widely used in the colonial Americas um, was, was called colonial currency. And every one of the 13 colonies had its own uh, currency. Um, it's really monopoly money. And again, the British economy was strong enough to really kind of be able to absorb this, launder the money, and make some sort of revenue out of it. But what the Currency Act does is it ends colonial currency. It says from now on, you can only pay us for our metal products, for our textiles, for all these great cool things that you're buying from us. You can only pay us in British gold and British silver. That's the only kind of payment that we will accept. So what that means is that your cost of living is going to go up. Assuming for a minute that gold and silver is more valuable and a harder commodity to come across than, you know, colonial currency, it's going to translate into an increase in the cost of living. What's even more dramatic would be the passing of the 1764 Sugar Act. Um, what I want to say about the Sugar Act is, was, is that it's not really anything new. Sugar is used to make molasses. And in the colonies, molasses was used to make rum. And rum was a huge, huge export in places like Boston. Um, John Hancock made a killing on the production of rum. The issue that Grenville had is that a lot of that fortune that Hancock had, had, had established was essentially from black market sugar. He was importing sugar from the Caribbean, um, not from English companies. Keep in mind, the way that British mercantilism was designed to work was if you are a British subject, which Hancock was, you were only supposed to be doing business with other British companies, British citizens, and he clearly wasn't. And the reason why is simple. It cost less. He didn't have to pay the taxes associated with it, and he chose not to. In 1733, 30 years, more than 30 years before the uh, Sugar Act is passed, there was the Molasses Act, which put a relatively modest tax on the importation of molasses from the Caribbean to places like Boston and the rest of the colonies. And so what Grenville's essentially saying is, listen, I'm not asking you to do something that, that I haven't asked you to do for a long, long time. These laws have been on the books. It's just you've chosen not to pay attention. And now I very much need you to pay attention. But aside from, like the Currency Act, potentially threatening to see the, the cost of living go up, um, there were many, many people that raised the concern that what the Sugar Act could ultimately do is violate colonial rights, rights as British subjects. Here's what I mean. This is really a twofold sort of issue here. And on the one hand, this is a tax. And it's a tax that was adopted in London in Parliament. And there was not one American colonist over there when this was adopted. And so what you get is that old adage, no taxation without representation. You haven't given us a chance to consent, and therefore this law is illegitimate in our eyes. This is Laconian. This is straight out of John Locke, that any form of legitimate government needs the consent of its citizens. And how in the world are we supposed to consent when we aren't even in the, in, 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 in the capital city, let alone in, in the annals of government, right? So that's issue number one. Issue number two is probably even more important. And issue number two involves what we'll call the writs of assistance, okay? Now, I want you to think about something for just a minute. When a police officer pulls over a car, um, that police officer does not necessarily have the right to search the car unless he or she has pretty good reason to believe that a law has either been broken, is about to be broken, or is in the process of being broken. Um, the other way that you could search the car is if you had a warrant from a judge. What writs of assistance were, were, were general search warrants. Um, they weren't very specific. Um, they, they just basically said, I, I have the authority to come onto your, your vessel, your, your ship, and look through it. 
And the reason that they were issuing these writs of assistance was because many, many times um, these ships did in fact have illegal contraband, including illegal sugar on them. What these writs of assistance ultimately violated was what you and I would call privacy, a reasonable expectation to have security and privacy in our own homes. Um, these, as far as the lawyer, like James Otis, was concerned, these violated our natural rights as Englishmen, that there were these laws in England that um, were designed to protect the colonial rights to privacy, and simply because you had a hunch or simply because it was Tuesday and you didn't have anything better to do, that did not give the government agent any authority to come snooping around our boats. We were also quite concerned, and James Otis himself was very concerned, about the use of these vice admiralty courts. Um, what a vice admiralty court was, was, was a court uh, on a boat, a British boat, in the middle of the ocean, uh, where, where there was no jurisdiction. And so a British judge would serve as judge, jury, and executioner. These international waters, um, they were not subject to any kind of laws. And this is a very slippery slope. And certainly James Otis saw it as a very slippery slope. And in a trial that Otis would ultimately lose in Boston um, in the 1760s, um, he is going to point out that privacy is a right. It's a right to, that, that Locke talks about. Um, you know, these, these things we are born with, they're not things that are granted. Government cannot take them away. The whole purpose of government is to protect those, protect those rights. And here we are seeing those rights violated. Um, Otis would... Would, would, like I said, ultimately lose the case, but there were other very important people in the courtroom on that particular occasion. One of them was John Adams, um, not only a founding father, but a future president, who said it was then and there that the child liberty was, was born. So we're beginning to move in this different direction here. Now, the Sugar Act was problematic for reasons that I've just got done discussing. The Stamp Act was, was a whole different animal. The Stamp Act is probably not what you may think it is. It has nothing to do with postage, it has nothing to do with the mail, nothing like that. What the Stamp Act was, was a tax. And it was a tax that had anything, or that, that it was a tax that placed um, an expense, a tax on anything with print on it. Um, think about that for a minute. Um, newspapers have print on them. Um, legal contracts have print on them. Wallpaper has print on it. And so generally speaking, what you're, what you're really talking about is, is a life tax here. I mean, at least with the Sugar Act, if, if you really felt it was the principle of the matter and you didn't want to pay it out of principle alone, um, I guess maybe you could switch to a different beverage. You know, you didn't have to drink the rum. Um, the Stamp Act wasn't like that, and it was by design. What the British had devised is what they felt was a fair tax. This tax burden wouldn't be shouldered unfairly. It would be spread pretty thinly throughout the colonial society. And if you think about it, if you're taxing everything, what you're going to do is you're going to create thousands and thousands of miniature origins every single day. I say miniature because the tax was not very exorbitant wasn't like it was a lot. In many cases, you barely even knew that you were paying it. But there was just so many of them. There were so many origins that it was a real revenue maker for, for the British. And of course, the, the, the colonists started screaming, no taxation without representation. And what the British say is, forget about that. You've got representation. You've got virtual representation. Now, as you might guess, this was a play on words. What the British meant was that there were sugar farmers from Barbados and Jamaica, and they were serving in the House of Commons. Um, we would call that the House of Representatives. But anyway, there's your representatives. But here's the thing about those sugar farmers. Not only were they in England, um, their families were in England. Uh, their children were educated in England. Um, all of their friends were in England. 
They just simply happened to have some economic interests over here in the New World, and they were you know, American in that capacity. It was a play on words, and the, and the colonists knew it. And going back to Albany, we, we, we really did feel that Albany Congress, we felt that we were square, that we had paid our dues when it comes to helping the British out. And they had no right to expect uh, us to pay for their debt. This was their war, for example. Okay, And so the Stamp Act is a really hotly contested issue, and it will lead to the Stamp Act Congress. What the Stamp Act Congress is, is not that much different than Albany. It is a, um, it's, it's a dilemma, it's a problem that is very common to pretty much everybody in the colonies. It's not just in Massachusetts or South Carolina. It's in New York, it's in Pennsylvania. And so what, what, what they do is they get together at this Congress and they begin to discuss how they might ought to address it. One individual that was especially concerned with what the Stamp Act may threaten was a guy that we've talked about in this class before, a guy by the name of Benjamin Franklin. Now, Franklin, as you might know from a previous lecture, was actually not a native Philadelphian. He, he was born in New England. Um, for reasons that we discussed a few, a few lectures ago, um, he was unhappy there. And he made this move to Philadelphia. But before he had made the move, um, he really had established himself as a tradesman, and in particular, as a print press operator. I know that you don't read the newspaper the way that old people used to read the newspaper. It's not really a paper anymore. It's, it's on your electronic devices. But during this period, the printing press was cutting edge technology when it comes to mass communication. It was the social media of its day in that capacity. And Franklin was a newspaper man. By, by knowing how to operate the printing press, he was able to communicate with the masses. And one paper that he was deeply involved with before he left Philadelphia was a paper that was known as the New England Courant. And this Courant was quite critical of many British policies. It, it was not simply the Stamp Act. It was, it was critical of other issues as well. Now, later on, when he gets to Philadelphia, he will start another newspaper known as the, the Pennsylvania Gazette, which was very critical of British policies. Now, here's the thing about newspapers. They're, they're right in the crosshairs of the Stamp Act, right? It doesn't get much more direct than, than print on paper. And certainly that's what the Stamp Act was targeting. And so Benjamin Franklin said, listen, not only is this hurting my bottom line, and illegitimately I might have you know, right? They don't have the right to do this. But, but, but I think a case could be made that ultimately what they're trying to do is shut down the press, right? I mean, the, 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 the you know, conflict between the press and politicians, that didn't just start a few, a few days ago, right? That, that is as old as time, really. And so what Benjamin Franklin is saying is by taxing newspapers, ultimately it's giving people an incentive not to buy newspapers. And if they don't buy newspapers, then how can they be informed? What the, what the Gazette is providing is valuable information. And by you taxing it, you're essentially shutting down the press. Now, this is an important concept, but it's also not going to be the last time that we talk about it. We've talked about John Peter Sanger, uh, that German immigrant in New York that establishes what we now call freedom of the press. It's Benjamin Franklin, a founding father, that insisted freedom of the press be not in the second, third, fourth, or fifth amendments, but it's it right there in the first amendment. It's a very important, very core principle of American democracy, and it has been from a very early start in our history. But back to the conflict. I really can't overstate the importance that taverns had in colonial life, especially in New England. Now, when I say tavern, you, you probably have a very different image in your mind than, than what taverns were in the colonial period. Of course, taverns were places where you could have an adult beverage and potentially even a meal. But more than anything else, what they really were were community centers. 
This is a place where you would go to hear the news. This was a place where you would go for not only entertainment, but camaraderie and uh, to see your neighbors, to see your co-workers, uh, rest, relaxation. And one of the more important taverns in, in all of Boston, and, and, and Boston's quickly becoming this hotbed of uh, revolutionary activity, that'd be the Green Dragon Tavern. Um, that would be where your colonial elites would hang out. Uh, people like John Hancock, James Otis, who we've talked about. Another patriot that we haven't discussed very much is Dr. Joseph Warren. And it's ultimately at this Green Dragon where they come up with the idea of, of what would later be called the Sons of Liberty. I think if you saw a collection of Sons of Liberty, what you probably would call these people would be a street gang. They were, they were toughs. Um, you might even go as far to say as in they were hoodlums. Um, they were menacing, they were intimidating. And, and, and really what they were what, what they were up to more times than not was, was trying to intimidate stamp collectors to uh, simply give up their stamps, to, to simply surrender uh, the, the process of collecting taxes. That's really what they were up to. But the Sons of Liberty were the, were the brain children of these colonial elites. Now, I need you to understand something. John Hancock, in particular, stands to lose a lot of money if these tax reforms go forward. And so he's got a lot of skin in the game. What these elites are ultimately doing via the Green Dragon Tavern is, is really stoking the flames of resentment. Right? All these British soldiers are over here. They don't have any right to be over here. They're raising your taxes, which is increasing the cost of living. There's all these unhappy consequences, and it all stems with British governmental interference. These elites know this. And they're preying upon the resentments of people that we would probably call working class. Young men that are finding it increasingly difficult to find jobs. And there is even a loose connection as to how the British fit into all of that as well. But for the time being, I want to talk to you a little bit about Paul Revere. Paul Revere was another one of these individuals that hung out in taverns, including the Green Dragon Tavern. And he, he had this very loose, abstract affiliation with the rabble, the Sons of Liberty. The rabble is what the British called them. Um, colonial life was very traditional in terms of gender norms. And um, the one place that women were, were, were I don't want to say allowed, but was seen as a respectable form of employment was working at a tavern, serving, in some cases, even owning a tavern, operating a tavern. And Paul Revere um, essentially is going to become a courier, a disseminator, a distributor of information. Certainly, you'll see what I mean a little bit later when he goes on his midnight ride. But for right now, what he's doing is he's gathering information. And the people that are, that, are, that are really gathering a lot of this intel for him are waitresses and tavern operators in places like Boston. It always seemed that Paul Revere knew exactly where to tell people like Hancock or later on Samuel Adams, this is where we will want to direct the Sons of Liberty's attention. Um, they always seem to show up at the... the the right time in the right place and the reason for that is that these waitresses and these tavern female tavern owners would gather information for Paul Revere they would be serving uh, British officers because the British frequented the, ta the taverns as well they'd be putting down their beer and putting down their shepherd's pie acting like they didn't care a thing in the world about the conversations that were being had at the table. All the while, they're, they're, they're taking copious mental notes as to what's happening. Who exactly is at that meeting, at that table? Where these guys are going? What they seem to be concerned about? There's, there's a lot that's going on, and the British aren't privy to any of this, right? And so they're really these undercover agents, if you will, um, that, 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 are, that are waging a form of warfare. They give that information to Paul Revere. Paul Revere, a member of the secret underground society, the Masonic Lodge of St. Andrew, he's kicking it up the chain of command. And again, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, 
But once we get to Paul Revere's Midnight Ride, information is ultimately his mission in that whole um, in that whole event. He's trying to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams that the British had come to arrest them, and he's also trying to warn everybody in Concord, Massachusetts, that they're coming for this weapons cache, and you need to keep that on lock and key, otherwise any semblance of independence is going to be next to impossible. But for right now, guys, I'm very hopeful that you can understand that it's here that um, these issues are really going to begin. It's here that we were going to be seeing a growing conflict between the British government as well as the American colonists. It's going to start out with respect to how do, how do we find ways to dig ourselves out of debt. But by 1765, certainly by 1766, the dynamic of that conversation is going to change. The paradigm is going to shift. It's no longer going to be how do we dig ourselves out of debt. Ultimately, what it's going to be is who's in charge, who calls the shots here. And you'll see what I mean the next time.